again, we're not here to say that you should burn everything in the summer. What we're saying is it's a great option because one of the biggest things that we look at, especially when we're trying to burn, of those people, of y'all that have burned, what's probably the, one of the biggest problems you run into getting all your burn units done? What, what's the biggest problem you face? Weather. Weather. I mean, what? What kind of weather? Wind mainly. So getting that right window and that right opportunity. And so if you have a season, so let's say you're going to burn from September to, or from February to April, and it gets to the end of April, what do you do? You don't burn. You say, oh, we can't get it done. And then what does that do to your burn season next year? It adds more to it, doesn't it? And then you're trying, you're in the same boat, keep trying. And so eventually what happens? Stuff doesn't get burned in a timely manner and doing that. But what if we lengthen that season out to where so we can say, hey, every day is a burn day. We just have to be ready for it. And we have to plan for it and we have to fit it into what our management goals are and what we're doing. That can increase the amount and the use of fire that we see. It can also decrease smoke impact. So if we're putting up a lot of smoke in the springtime, what if we spread that smoke load out over the whole season? I know my folks with DEQ like that. <laughs> they do like that. Because again, that's, that's what's a big part of it. We can still burn the same acre. We can get more acres burned. But we can spread that out over different seasons and we can have different benefits and different things that we got going with that. And so John and I um, have been working on this research for, this is the third summer that we've been out here collecting this data. And what we do is starting in April, uh, we come out every two weeks and we, we write down every broadleaf flowering plants that has plants that have a flower on them. So we write down every species and then we also write down how many there are. Is there one? Is there um, less than 10 or is there greater than 10? So we just kind of have these categories, broad categories. So we walk through each of these plots, then we come back two weeks later. We continue to do this till the end of October. So we're trying to, we're only doing this for broadleaf plants. We're mostly interested in this for pollinators. Um, so we're not looking at grasses at all, just the broadleaf plants that we can find. And so, um, so far we've just kind of looked at what season they're responding to. Um, after this year and next year, we're gonna, we'll have, that'll be our, our last year likely, and we'll look at how, how they're responding to time since fire. So today I'm just gonna talk about how, how many plants we're finding in those different burn seasons. And so um, here, I have a handout here. Hopefully you've gotten one. If you haven't, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Um, we've got some folks walking around and handing those out. Um, so. So the first graph I have on here is just looking at the number of species that we found. Um, we found over 100 species within this small area. This is about two acres total. Um, I think, are we at 120 species, something like that? 120 spe different flowering species um, in these plots. So that's, that's pretty amazing um, as far as species diversity. And what we found is that the spring burns and no burns had the least number of flowering species um, throughout the season. The season where, we've ha where we're finding the most are kind of July through November um, or December. So when we burn in those kind of late growing season through early dormant season, that's when we're seeing the biggest flowering, the greatest number of species um, that next year. When we look at how many plants we're finding, um, if you look at the second graph here, the plant, the, the season of burn where we found the greatest abundance of flowering plants is the July-August burn. So when we burn in July and August, we have the most quantity of flowering plants throughout that, that sampling time from April through the end of October. Um, and the March, April, and May, June burns um, had very few flowering plants. Um, they were similar to the to the non the non burn plant the the control plots that aren't burnt, um, and as you can see, those plots are just covered up in woody plants. Um, we do have some flowering species in there, like blackberry and stuff that that and Mexican plum, um, but very few broadleaf flowering plants, and in that in the control. Then I, I looked at the data and I tried to find plants that were only found in one season of burn. So they're really particular. They're not really a rare, rare species, but they're very particular about what time of year they get burnt. And so we had the most, 
rare species that were only um, found in one season of burn in the July, August burns again. So there was eight species that were only found within that season of burn. There were 28 species total that were only found in one season of burn. And if you're interested in a specific plant species, just contact John Ryan. We can, we can let you know what species there are. There's just so much, so much information from this research, just kind of trying to give you an overview. Then I also looked at the plants that were kind of fire, they're fire dependent. So we found them in all the different season of burn plots and not in the control plots. And there were three plants that we found there. We found lead plant, morphokinescence that was in, in all of the treatments that had had burn, but not found in the treatment that hadn't had any fire. And we also found the light poppy mallow and false garlic. And so, and lead plant, you know, this is a shrub, and, and once it gets established, it, it grows a, a pretty large root system. And this plant will respond extremely quickly after fire. So I was in Dewey County in July after the Ray Fire, and in July I saw plants that had been burnt in the wildfire that were knee high um, already and flowering. So um, this plant's very well adapted to, to fire. It's an excellent forage species um, and also a plant that's used by many different pollinators. Then I looked at just kind of the species that we found in all of the plots, whether they were burnt or not. They're kind of generalists. They don't have particular requirements. And so I've listed I listed those nine species here. So we have green antelope horn milkweed. This is a really, really important pollinator plant, an important monarch plant. Um, this plant is important because it has a very wide distribution, so you find it in a lot of different areas. Um, there's other plants that are more common if you go up into the Dakotas, but this plant around here is, you find it a lot of places, and it's not it's not extremely particular about whether there's been some kind of disturbance, mowing or uh, heavy grazing, or whether there hasn't been disturbance. It does well regardless, but it responds really well to fire. And I'll talk about a little bit more specifically about this plant in a second. Some of the other plants that we found, tall thistle. There, we do have native thistles here that are also important for some of our native pollinators. We don't want to kill all of our thistles. Obviously, we do have some thistles that uh, can be invasive, but tall thistle isn't one. Uh, daisy fleabane, I picked one of those. So all these little white flowers that you see around, that's daisy fleabane. We found this in all of our plots, whether they'd been burned or not. This is another one that um, quite a few pollinators use uh, during the season and um, is kind of an early season uh, bloomer. Another plant that we found, we found, so we found Cerise Lespedeza, and I'm going to save all of that for Cooper. He's going to talk about that. But we also found Slender Lespedeza, and that's a native Lespedeza, and we found it blooming in all of our plots. We found Cat Claw Sensitive Bar. I didn't pick one of those because they hurt. Another plant that we found that is also a really important plant for pollinators is uh, Passion Flower, Passion Vine. Um, not a ton of people know about this plant, but this is this is a native uh, plant that grows in our in our pastures and um, is grazed. And so sometimes we don't find it in grazed pastures, but we do find it here in the season of burn plots. Um, it's an excellent plant for pollinators, um, and the foliage is, is eaten by larval, uh, like caterpillars and stuff. So that one was another one that was a generalist. And then we had scurf pea and pitcher sage, and I'll talk more about scurf pea. Scurf pea. This is scurf pea, and this plant we had blooming pretty much the entire time we are sampling, Clo close. I mean, it starts early and it keeps blooming till the very end of the growing season. So we'll talk about scurf pea. So even though these plants are kind of found regardless of whether you burn or not, we wanted to see if our the season of burn would change um, how long they're blooming for or how many of them are blooming. And so I'll start with green antelope horn milkweed. It was the most common milkweed that we found. We did find some other uh, milkweeds in these plots, but that was by far the most common. And if you look here, this dark purple line is the July-August, the very tallest line on this graph. So we had the greatest number of blooming green antelope milkweed in the July and August burns again. And we also found that the May-June burn pushed flowering back to mid-June and August. So they didn't, it had, didn't have the greatest quantity, but you could kind of manipulate when it was blooming relative to what 
pollinator you are interested in providing habitat for. All the treatments had flowering plants for, for six to eight weeks, so that's good. And the no burn definitely had the least flowering plants of antelope, green antelope horn milkweed. The next one, scurf pea that I showed you, um, this plant flowered for the longest period and the greatest number in the Jul July, August burns. So yet again, that July, August burn time frame is an important time if you're trying to manage for really specific pollinators. The May-June plots had the shortest and the fewest flowering plants in them. So they're just, you know, what's likely happening is those plants are just starting to grow in May and June, and when you, when you burn them, you're probably just setting them back a little bit, and so that's what's happening with those early burns. Lastly, the passion flower. We had the greatest number of passion flower blooms in our May and June burns. So this one's a little bit different than what we found with some of the other species. Um, in our September, October burns had the shortest and the fewest flowering plant, um, flowers of passion flower. So depending on what species you're trying to manage for, you might tweak when you're burning, obviously. The most important thing is that you're burning, right? Because the non-burn plots are the ones that we are finding the fewest flowering plants in general. And so if we're just trying to have diverse flowering plants, burning at any time is gonna help provide that. But if you could burn portions of your um, ranch at different times of the year, you could increase the diversity and the quantity of flowering plants that you have throughout that time period. If there's any pollinator folks that are really um, geeking out on the plants. I have, I have a list of, all, of uh, some of the plants that we've identified that are extremely important for pollinators. We re we're recording every flowering species, but of course some of them are more important than others. So there's that in the, in the handout as well. In general, you know, we just want to try to help encourage you guys to do some burning. Burning is so important for our grasses, but it's also important for our broadleaf plants. And you know, if we don't burn, we're going to have woody plants growing and they're going to suppress both the grasses and the broadleaf plants. If we incorporate different timing of burning, we can help to um, create a little bit more opening in that grass canopy to allow those broadleaf plants to grow and flower.